How you guys doing? How was that? Fantastic. It's interesting, right? You learn something new about someone. I hope that you can do that with anybody you'd like to share. Introduce one person. Can I get like one or two introductions? Go ahead. Uh, my friend Amari here is from Richmond. Wants to be anesthesiology. He's a freshman. He's awesome. already looking into this stuff. So good for him. Amari. 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 Nice to meet you. A lot of friends do. I thought about doing anesthesia. It's a very. It's an excellent quality of life. I thought about doing pain management. Pain medicine. So we can talk more about it. Then, if you if you want. Anybody else? One more. Go ahead. This is Princess. She's a freshman. She wants to be a. Fantastic, fantastic, Pete. Man, Pete was tough. I mean, I, I had a tough time with Pete, so I remember uh, my first patient on Pete, just like a tra much tragic story. Of course, at Mass General Hospital, you get like the sickest people. It was like a trillion transfers, and we're, uh, I was actually at Boston Children's at the time, that's where I did my Pete's uh, rotation, part, part of it. And this kid came and he had something called Eastern Equine Encephalitis. So Eastern Equine Encephalitis is, is a brain infection, basically, that you get from getting bit by a mosquito. Uh, a specific mosquito with a specific uh, 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 parasite in it. Um, and anyway, it infects like 10 to 12 people a year in this country. But really, it doesn't exist anywhere else. So it's, a, it's a, a, a something that's in mosquitoes. Like malaria, but it's just very, it's very low prevalence. Well, you know, in virtually 100% of the time, it's lethal. Um, and unfortunately, in his case, he was uh, 14 years old and it was lethal. Um, it was my very first patient I had, and it was devastating. And it probably ruined me for the field of pediatrics because I just couldn't handle it. Not to discourage you from doing pediatrics. <laughs> it's great. It's great. But um, <laughs> most kids do great. But for me, that that's the experience that sticks out in my head. Um, in pediatrics, it's just like sometimes um, in medicine, what we say is your first case, your, lap, your your most recent case, and your worst case. So a lot of what your clinical decision making is based on ends up being the first time you've ever saw that disease, the last time you ever saw it, and the worst thing that's ever happened when it happens. So you you make a lot of your decisions that are kind of gut decisions to do X, Y, or Z based on those kinds of things. Um, so, because that was my first case, forget about it. It wasn't happening, <laughs> but I cried and I cried like a baby. But, um, all right, so let's get on to the workshop series. So, this is part one. How do I get in? So, this is, this is meant to be an overview. Um, it's meant to be an overview. So, four signs you might be a free man. I thought this was kind of cute. You're volunteering for something. Like... Everybody's volunteering for something. I was volunteering for many things. I think we all identified that. You cried over a grade. I don't know if I did that, but I was, I was ruthless. I was ruthless. But if I, trust me, I, I, I remember going to, uh, I took a, a, a psychology class with a guy named, oh man, what is his name? Uh, Whitman. Whitman. Anybody take Whitman's class in here? Yeah, so I took a class with Whitman, Gordon Whitman. And I remember on the first test, you had to have a 92, 94 to get an A, I think, was a 94 to get an A, and I got a 92 in the first test. I said, damn, I'm going to get an A minus in this class. <laughs> and I went to, what do I have to do to get better? What do I have to do to get, to get those grades? It's only three tests, and you need to, or basically you need to get 100 on the next two tests, and I do not want any money, because that's a 3.7, that wouldn't mess up my perfect 4.0. So I just really, I really was like neurotic about it. Um, not that my little sister all had a 4.0 in college, so I had a little bit of a chip on my shoulder, because she's a couple years younger than me. She went through college, had a 4 and she went to school in Michigan, but um, uh, I was, I was just, I had a little chip on my shoulder, so I was like, I know I'm smarter than my sister. There's no question. So, um, so you dream of Orgo. I did this, for sure. I did, I remember in Orgo in the synthesis reactions, I did every question in the back of every chapter because I just didn't get it. I just wasn't that good at it. Um, I TA'd it, but I was, <laughs> I've been doing well enough to not have to take the final, but it, I, it took a lot of work. It wasn't because I was just really smart, this just came naturally to me. It was because, you know, I just really had to work at it. I think everyone who's ever taken Ralph Stevens' class can appreciate when you really have to work for something, but you're just not. I never took that class. But, but um, I, I've heard, I was scared to take that class in all honesty at the time. 
Uh, but anyway, so you dream of Borgo, you make um, hysterical pose, I gotta be in chemistry this semester, do I have any chance of getting into medical school? And the answer is yes, yes. I tell a story because I think it's important. A girl who went to a community college first and applied to our school last year, she went to community college in California, she, uh, Went to after that, she transferred to UC Berkeley, but in her community college transcript, she failed organic chemistry to the first time. And she really uh, told a great story about how all this happened, and I'm not going to get into it. The point is, she failed organic chemistry to the first time, and we enthusiastically asked her to come be a part of the Harvard Medical School class of uh, 2019. Um, and we, and so, so the point is, is that you know you can miss a hoop. It's how you, how you bounce back because that's important. Okay, so we'll talk about that um, during this, this thing. So I want to give, this first thing is a 30, is, is 20 to 30 minute talk. A lot, there's going to be time for question and answer, but it's going to be a 10,000 foot view. I thought this was a cool thing in the airport because everyone always talks about 10,000 foot view, but this is, I don't remember the name of the airport. It's in Europe. Anyway, that's the 10,000 foot view from near the airport. So anyway, step one. Oh, so this is the first step to getting into med school. And I think this is it. This is so, and I already told you this. Be foolish enough. I'm, I'm like, I always wanted to make a quote. Let me just say that. Let me just say that. I wanted to make this like inspiring quote one day, and I feel like I've done it. So be foolish enough to think you can do it and be stubborn enough to not let anyone or anything get in your way. You cannot and will not fail if you do that. So that's by me. <laughs> but I, I, I truly, that's it, the end, that's it, that's all you need to know. I'll see you guys later, thank you guys for coming. This, this, seriously, that is really it, that's the secret sauce. I'm, we're going to talk about more things, but that's the secret sauce. You have to buy in, you do. You have to believe you can do it. Everyone looked at me like I was a damn fool for coming in there. I walked in, had my baseball cap on. It's like, hey, you know, I walked in. I remember going to Kim Herbert's office, and I was like, look, I know you're a pre-med advisor. I really am excited. I came here to, to become a doctor. You know, I quit my job. I gave up everything. This is what I want to do. And I really, really want to go to Harvard Medical School. How can you help me get this? And she just looked at me like I had two heads. And she's like, uh, what are you talking about? <laughs> and so we went through this thing, but I was foolish enough, despite all of that whole conversation that we had, she's like, you know, just work really hard, blah, blah, blah. You could tell it was a little bit, you know. First of all, and, and not, no, no, it's not a problem with her. She's never seen that. You know, she's never seen someone come here and go to Harvard Medical School. So, you know, she's just like looking like, really? Like, this is what you want to do? Like, how are you, how are you put? Tell me how you're planning on doing that. Because I don't see how you're going to do it. So, um, that, that was kind of the case. But I really, really was. I was foolish enough to believe that I could do it. And I would, I'm so damn stubborn when you get to know me. So, here, so this is the first, this is the first step, really. How do you get in? So, this is obvious to everyone. Study. 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 But this part is not obvious. Because you know what happens in four years of just doing this? You get really, really, really burned out. Really burned out. And I know a lot of people have done it and they end up giving up. Some people, like my sister, just steadfast. Like they need to study all day, every day. I can't do it. I can't do it. So, uh, but she can do it. But I, I can't do it. So I think that for most people, people in the normal part of the bell curve, not off on the on the extremity need this, work-life balance, right? And I did a lot of this. I'm not saying everyone, this is work-life balance. But I, I went out a lot. I went out to club, like I was just a nightclub person. I, uh, I went out a lot, like during college, probably four nights to five nights a week. Um, and, and the way I did it, I'm gonna tell you, this is how I, that's what I like, this is what I like, but I'm gonna tell you why. I'm gonna tell you why. Because I really like to do that. First of all, the second thing is though, is what I did is I had to earn it. I had a job here and I came in, it didn't matter if my first class started at 12. So you take 15, well I took 21 credit hours at a time. So when I took, I took 21 credit hours because I just wanted to get through because I felt like I was old, which I wasn't. But I, 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 I wanted to get through and I took 21 credit hours. So 21 credit hours, you know, broken down five days a week, you're taking about four hours of class a day. So if you work a nine hour day, like most people do, you have five hours every day to study. So I came in at eight o'clock in the morning 
tried to be here at 8, sometimes it was 8.30, sometimes it was 9, but no matter what time I got here, I worked a nine-hour day. I worked, I worked, I worked, I worked, and I didn't stop working. I went to class, I went to the library. I went to class, I went to the library. I went to class, I went to the library. When I got home at 6 or 7 o'clock, at night every day, I took this place off like a backpack when I threw it at the door, and that was it. And I didn't worry about this anymore because I had studied five or six hours a day. Now, some people like to go home and they like to get on Facebook and they like to study a little bit and get on Facebook a little bit and study a little bit and get on Twitter and study Instagram, study whatever. And that's, and that's really inefficient for me. Some people are maybe, maybe efficient that way. I couldn't do it, so I just went hard while I was here. And then when I left, I didn't do anything. I had fun. I went to dinner with my friends. I did lots of other things. So that was my approach. I think that approach works. You know, I'm not saying that, and I hardly ever studied in the weekend. When there was a huge, huge, huge test on Monday, sometimes I would study on Sunday. Um, but I was usually so far ahead um, that I didn't need to because I really did work every day. Whether I had a test or not, day one of the semester starts, nine hour day, going in. Like, that's it. So that's the way I did it. I knew I needed that because I'm not as disciplined as I should be, and I would, I, I would, I would, I would cram if I didn't. And I took that to medical school, and it worked very well. You have to have longer than a nine hour day in medical school, but it worked very well. So the next step, I think, to getting into medical school is planning. Planning, planning, planning. So, the big problem with most people, and the, the big hiccup, is that there is no plan. You walk in and the plan is this, or you do have a plan, but here's the plan. I'm going to study biology, I'm going to do really well, I'm going to go to medical school. Do well in the of medical school. Not how it works. Not how it works. Everything that you do has to be strategic. You know, and so if you do it that way, you're bound to miss hoops, because there's literally, I remember when I interviewed at BCU, Quick story. Guy interviewed me and said, you know what, Devon? There's like, people put out all these hoops, admissions committees have all these hoops all over the place, and they expect every student to jump through them, and if there's not, there's one person who'll say, you know what, that person's not qualified for medical school. And if, it might only be that one person, but if that person has a loud voice, then, you know, they don't get in. And um, that, that can be true. But the question is, if, I mean, if you miss a hoops, a lot of times you can go back and jump back through the hoop. Um, so, but without a plan, you're bound to miss hoops. Without knowing the hoops are there, I talk about Donald Rumsfeld, who I, I don't love, but he did say something, I think, really, he had one of those hoops. He said, he was, I think he was being interviewed by Diane Sawyer, and he said, look, there are, there are known knowns, there are known unknowns, but there are unknown unknowns, and those unknown unknowns, those things you don't know that you don't know, that will get you every time. And it's true. And that, that is so true of medical school, and until you have a plan, there are bound to be unknown things you didn't even know you missed, that you missed, because you didn't have a solid plan when you walked in the door. Now the thing is, you can miss them, like the girl who, who, who got the F in, in organic chemistry, but you just have to know how to get back to that hoop and figure it out somehow. Okay, because that, that's really, really, really important. So planning, 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 and that's why I'm here. So this whole workshop is really designed around coming up with a, a plan. And it's, if you're day one, this will be super beneficial because you, you will have the opportunity not to miss any hoops. Um, if, you're, if you're day, you know, how many, 1600, that's four years, right? You're day like 1600, you, you have to go, you, have to, you can figure out that you missed hoops before you apply and go back and figure out how you're gonna make that up. But we're gonna talk about both of those things and everything in between while we're here over the next couple of days. So this is an overview. All right, so well, how do I plan? So here's how we start. The M-S-A-R. The M-S-A-R. Who knows what that is? You know what that is. Oh, well. Now, that's a tragedy. And it tell you that one person, two people, it's a tragedy. This is, this is what we were missing right here. This is what we were missing. Day one, when, we said, when I raised my hand and said, I want to be a doctor, this should have been in my hand. Somebody should have handed me this. This is what we have to fix. This is why I'm here. The medical school, I'm gonna show you the cover page of the MSR on the next page, but the MSAR is essentially the Bible for getting into medical school. It's published by this little organization called the AMC, who administers the MCAT, who is the accrediting organization for all medical schools, who handles the admissions process for um, pre-med, 
who's going into medical school, who handles the residency match program when you go and match into residencies, who is the accrediting organization for all of the residency programs. This is the organization that governs everything. They tell you, they, they put out a publication that is free to the university and <coughs> only $25 to you if you go buy it online that gives you a step-by-step -step outline of not only most of the things that you need to know to go to medical school, but also two pages on every single medical school in this nation. Two pages on every single medical school in this nation on what their admission statistics are, what their, their mission statement is, what kind of summer research opportunities they have, what's the number for their office of adversity, what, you know, they have all this, what's the curve, what are their, what's their average MCAT, what's their resident, what are their residency match rates, what are their average step one score, what is this and what is that, it's everything you need to know about a med school is in there. And also, there's a, a part in the beginning that tells you everything you know to ha need to know how to get into medical school. Not everything you need to know, but you still need mentorship. manager. This, is, this should be your like, absolute reference, so everyone should make note of this and get this, for sure. So how do I claim? This gentleman was here, he just walked out, right? Mm -hmm. But he was here, right? He leads this team of people who are a great resource to help you plan. Okay, you need, you need people to help you plan, so these people get paid to do this, right? And so you have to make them earn their paycheck, and make them help you plan, okay? This is important. All right, this is an abstract way to look at mentorship. So this is the person who's your mentor who's already been down here. By virtue of the fact they're here, they've been here, right? So you have somebody, these people haven't necessarily been where you wanna go, right? So these people are different than these people. These people have great utility in, in some ways. These people have great utility in other ways. There are things that these people can do that these people can't. There are things that these people can do that these people can't. I think it's important to understand that distinction. These are two different groups of people and they're both very, they're both very important. But when you have a men, you need mentorship. That's how you, that, that's another way to help plan. They're gonna help you go through your plan and tell you what works about it and what doesn't. And then the internet, the great equalizer. It's the one thing that helps, I think, the one, one of the greatest benefits of the internet is that it helped people that come from middle class families, who come from lower class families, actually learn the things that people learn in their everyday lives when you come from high society. So it's all there. You just have to look it up. You have to obsess. Obsess about it when you're developing the plan. Once you have the plan well articulated, then all you have to do is execute the plan. So I had the plan before I walked in day one to this place. I had the plan on what I was gonna do. Plan changed a little bit here and there, but for the most part it stayed the same because I, I had all these people, I had this, these, these people, I had already looked at this, I had this. That's why I made it there, not because I'm of you know, superior intelligence. It really isn't. It's because I had this excellent plan. And that most people that come from these kinds of pla the places like Old Dominion don't have this. So that's what, that's what really helped me. So I want to give you the first page. Here's a, a stuff from the first page, the official guide. Their own words, the official guide to medical school admissions, how to prepare and for and apply to medical school. That's what the MSAR is. That's the first page inside the MSAR. Now, the fact that you guys all didn't know that is not your fault. That is a unknown unknown. It's an unknown unknown. But that's why I'm here. That's why I'm here, to help you with these things. All right, plan, more, facts, applicant and matriculant data. This is on the AAMC website. You're going to be seeing the common thing. So if you go to this website, you're going to have a wealth of knowledge. But they give you the they give you all kinds of spreadsheets. There's like 32 spreadsheets on everything you want to know, like what percentage of people did research, what percentage of people, you know, if I'm a white female with a GPA of blah 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 and a MCAT of blah blah, what percentage of those people that were in my category applied and got in? I can show you that. Here, so this is an example of one of the spreadsheets that I just cut and pasted from there. White applicant, GPA, 3.4, go here. MCAT, 24 to 26, 7, 1,759 applied, 266 got in, 15.1, you know, but 15.1% yield, basically. But then you look and you're like, oh, three people got in with an 18 to 20 MCAT and 2.6 to 2.8. So they had something, some other people helping them, mentors, 
other people that helped him bridge this gap. So you can be somewhere, you would, I mean, everyone would love to be like right here, right? Everyone. But then there are these people that also didn't get in, maybe they didn't have the mentorship. There are still people, can you believe it, who had a 3.8 to 4 and had a third, I mean, they just rocked to the end, the end cap. That's like 99 percentile, right? You got a 40, I mean, come on, what do you want? So, but then, <laughs> but for real, but we want more than that. We turn those people down every year. We turn those people down. Um, they don't have, because they don't have a complete application, because we care more about this. This is important, but we care more than, than this. We care about who we're getting. We want an excellent position, not, you know, Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein probably wouldn't be a great position. He probably could do this, right? But he might, he probably would not be a great position. So, you know, there's still 6% of those people don't get in. So, but this helps you. This helps you plan and say, what do I need to do to kind of give myself a comfortable um, buffer? And then, then based on this, how many schools do I need? If you're 90% gonna get in, you don't need to apply to 30 schools, right? But maybe if you're like 30% to get in, maybe you want to apply to 30 schools. Do you know what I mean? So you can so you can increase your odds. So this is this is how this all helps you plan. Professors, Dr. Douglas Mills back there. Get to know them. I got to know you very well. Okay. These are these are the. So you know, I'm gonna wear these three bars here. Uh, and then, yeah, I'm inside. I get to wear three bars. But but uh, no, the um, these professors. It's really important to get to know them because these people write your letters of recommendation. Unknown, unknown. These letters of recommendation are probably the most important thing in your application. Soup to nuts. The most important thing in your recommendation, if ever, I don't care what MCAT GPA you have, if everyone you've ever met and written you a letter of recommendation says you walk on water, then damn it, you walk on water. Who are we to tell them that you don't? Seriously. You walk, I mean, it's, it's, that's it. So it's, it really, it really is important. Get to know these people. Go to their office hours. Trump up a reason to go say hello. I'm not joking. Seriously, I'm, I'm not joking. Get to know them. They're very, very, very important and critical when you're, when you're applying to get a good letter of recommendation. And we're going to talk later about how to get those letters of recommendation, what you ask them. You ask them specific things like, can you, in your letter, tell, tell them what kind of student you think I am, what kind of questions I asked in class. I gave them a whole list of things I wanted them to say. I didn't say exactly what to say. I wouldn't have answered certain questions. What kind of position they think I'm going to be how they see me interact with my classmates, you know, what is my, my level of intellectual curiosity. I want them to comment on all those things. How did I know that? I read them. Here are all the things admissions committees look for in a letter of recommendation. And I asked them, straight up, if you, if you cannot say, write me a good letter on all these points, I don't want you to write me a letter. Can you do that? So I'm not getting the templated letter that everyone else is getting because I've asked them to do that specifically. Uh, no, no, no. All right, so medical experience. Everyone knows you get medical experience. There's a lot of different ways you can do it. Shadowing is a must. You must shadow a physician. If you want to be a dentist, you must shadow a dentist. If you want to be a PA, you must shadow a PA. This is just, it's compulsory at this point. This is shadowing. Then it's EMT. There are a lot of people, this is all, Virginia Beach is a major metropolitan area with an all volunteer fire department in Virginia Beach. Um, not as I know a lot of people take this path, um, and it looks really, really, really good. So, um, if you're interested, it's a good, really good way to get your feet wet and to show that you're like really interested in medicine, especially in that you're a volunteer. Um, this is supposed to demonstrate a hospice. That's another way. Um, there's a lot of focus on end of life care today. So, uh, one unknown, unknown is that you, as pre meds, are expected to know the trends in medicine. Like you read the American Med the Journal of the American Medical Association every week. I know you know. You wouldn't know what you're reading if you read JAMA every week. But you're supposed to know the trends in medicine, so this is where your mentors come in. So one of the trends in medicine is end of life care. So when they see an applicant, they see, oh, this person's this person's passionate about end of life care. It looks good. It looks good. It's. It, th these are where your mentors come in, and these are where maybe your mentors come in, but maybe your advisors don't know, you know, and so that's why those two groups of people are different extracurriculars. So I wanted to show my opinion in certain med schools that I'm well-rounded, so I wrote a poem in Spanish about how a chess club has made me a better quarterback. <laughs> yeah, 
So, more is not better, better is better. I'm just gonna say that. I'm gonna leave it at that. More is not better, better is better. Start something new. Do something no one else has done before. Make an impact. Think about, you know, make an impact and you should do it from the heart. But also, it's not a bad idea to think about how it looks on paper. Okay, because you are ultimately going to apply. And that is ultimately part of the motivation, I think, for everybody. I don't think you're a bad person because you're motivated because you want to become a physician and you're like, oh, well, maybe I'll do this and maybe that'll really look good on my application. And I like, did this thing. You know, so, like for me, we did, we went to barbershops and we did, um, I went to at black barbershops where hyper, you know, in the pe black population, hypertension is very high. They have low rate of going to see PCP. So we went to black barbershops with black people black men congregate, and everybody over the age of 50, we screen their blood pressure. We just told them they had high blood pressure. Simple thing to do. I mean, anybody can be trained to do, to take, do a blood pressure cut, and medical schools love that. They love it. So, you know, these are the kinds of things. It's a very simple thing, but I thought about, I, I thought I wanted to do that and help them and give them a pamphlet on, you know, blood pressure. I also thought about, man, the med schools are going to love this. I, I mean, it's true. So, you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. All right, the MCAT, the daunting MCAT. Everyone's stressed about the MCAT. So we'll have a whole session about the MCAT. I'm not going to go crazy with it right now. All I will say is this. If I say this, you, there are all of you people that are going to be physicians that have been successful students. Yeah. And as successful students, you're inclined to study for every test the same way. You're like, man, I studied for OCHEM this way, and it's the exact same way I studied for physics, and it's the exact same way I studied for gym chem, and it got me, you know, top person in my class and all of them. So I think I'll just study for the MCAT, which is basically just this, the same one. Wrong answer, you will be in this bottom, this bottom left thing over here, or maybe in the upper left thing with the <laughs> MCAT score. It really is the wrong answer. There is a way this test is not designed to figure out if you're a, 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 an expert in organic chemistry or in physics or in anything like that. It's a test designed to see how you think about things and um, it's like a series of games trying to see how, how, you, how your analytical thinking is for being a doctor and it's something you can train to do well. But you have to know how to train to do it. It is not go back to read your organic chemistry book from front cover to cover all over again. That is a total waste of time. You won't remember it any better than you remembered it before you read it. You really won't. And you won't remember much of it. So, the, the, I mean, it's just true. I remember, very, I could not tutor organic chemistry right now. In no way. Um, but, I couldn't even tutor like a class I took in second year right now. <laughs> no way. <laughs> but, anyway, so, um, um, this is important. So, I, I, I really hope if you, and, and again, I want to just reiterate this. If, if there's any part of this that you guys don't feel is for you or like that you just you have other things you'd rather be doing, you guys can really feel free to come and go as you please. You're not offending me. If you're, if you're here just for one part of it, please just come to that one part. That is fine. I want to let you know that. But this MCAT part, I really, 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 really encourage everyone to go. And again, in every section, there are a lot of unknown unknowns. So you might not know that this is not important to you or that this is important to you. You might think it's not. So anyway, the MCAT portion, we'll go over that. Um, next, uh, or tomorrow, but um, I hope that you guys can uh, attend because I really had great success with helping people bring their MCAT scores up from like being in like the 10th and 20th percentile to being in like the 80th percentile, just by, literally just by like going through a system and learning how to do it. I do a lot of tutoring. I tutor for the MCAT. I couldn't tutor you how to, for instance, I tutor for the MCAT and I, you know, I charge a lot of money in Boston tutoring for the MCAT to very rich families, but, <laughs> and I tutor some people for free who are from poor families, I do. I tutor for the MCAT. But, um, you know, I couldn't tutor organic chemistry too. But I can tell you what's relevant for the MCAT, and I'm excellent at that. So, you, you know, this is just a demonstration that the MCAT is, you know, you have to, you have to learn how to take the test, what's important. So undergraduate research, so a lot of people don't think this is important. So I want to tell you that, and we'll get to it later, but 81% of people who matriculated in medical school have done research in undergrad. 
That's higher than the percentage of people who have above a 3.5 GPA. So it's counterintuitive to think that having a, a, a 3.5 GPA is important, but doing undergraduate research is not. It just it, 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 it defies logic. It wasn't, it, was, it wasn't something that was enforced here, and I think that was one of the big problems here. Um, I think that was the, an overarching huge problem here. You, every, undergraduate research is, is, at this point, like for our school, if you don't have undergraduate research, you are almost definitely not getting in unless you like save the world and you have the Presidential Medal of Freedom and all that other stuff. You're like not getting in. Uh, it's, it's really important. So I can't, I can't stress this to you enough. Undergraduate research, think about it. And we're gonna talk, there's gonna be a little session today, 10 minutes on undergraduate research, where some opportunities are. I get paid undergraduate research, I get paid good money, they pay for my housing, they pay me a nice stipend, like $3,000 a month, plus I wasn't paying rent. I mean, that's pretty nice for undergrad, right? So like, and you go there, you do research, and they write you a hell of a letter. A professor of medicine writes you a hell of a letter. And then at your interviews, they get to talk about this whole letter that this person, you know, loves you. Uh, so, we'll talk about it. Find yourself, okay? This is, this is part of how you get to medical school. You have to find yourself. You have to make sure that you want it. You have to make sure this is you. You have to make sure that, you know, you're not doing this for any other reasons and that it's you really, this is you. This is what you want to be. And so you need to really, this is the time in undergrad to find yourself. You know, you can find yourself by, so some people take this the wrong way. And they say, oh, I really don't like biology. You know, I didn't like, no offense to Doug, I didn't like plant biology either. I, I like the human biology. I could not care less about the plant. That was just me. He's a plant biologist. He was, great guy, one of my mentors, one of my advisors. Great guy, love him to death. Plant biology, not my thing. It goes into the lecture about the plant biology. I like <laughs> muddle through it. I read through every page of the text that he has in the syllabus, but not interested. Got to learn. Not interested, <laughs> but I have to learn. So that was me, plant biology. But the thing is, is, I didn't have to study biology. So I studied. I didn't do biology for that reason. I studied public health um, for undergrad. But I have classmates that study, like one of my, what two of my classmates study dance. You know, and just because that, that's what they love. And they were excellent dancers, they were really passionate about it. And yeah, they came in and picked that song that on, on organic chemistry, but they, 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 they loved dance, so that's what they did, and so they excelled. They excelled, they, did, they got all A's because, hey, they loved it. So it's important to find yourself in undergrad and study what you really love. And you'll, be, you'll do better at that than you will studying something you don't love because of what your end goal is. So, that's something. So, Let's see how much time we have left on. All right, yeah, so about five, like three or four minutes if we have any questions pertaining to this. The next section is going to be basically a question and answer session that's kind of like myths about, it's about this basically, getting into medical school, what are the myths? Um, that's going to be like 25 minutes. So um, I have about three minutes left in this session before we start the next session because I do want to stay to a schedule. I know you guys all have five minutes going. Does anybody have any burning questions right now before we go on to the next session? Go ahead. Quick question. I mean, how much research qualifies as having done research? For example, you know, I'm coming up close to my time to apply. Uh -huh. I've done a little bit of research, not much, but I'm looking to do some over the summer. So if I, between now and application time, I've got four or five months of research, is that going to I did three months. So I just did one summer. What's your name? Mike. Mike. I did, I did one I summer, Mike. Um, I applied to this program. Doug had it on his. A lot of people took Doug's class. He had it on, if you look through the blackboard, he had it on blackboard, it's been there, it's still there. Um, there's a list, of, and I'll show you where there's a link to go online and find it, um, but there's a list of all these summer internship and residency programs where it's an internship and you get to go there. So what I was able to do is I was able to do research under a full professor at, at Hopkins for three months, and also, also because I was interested in going MD, she allowed me to go shadow on Fridays and Thursday afternoons. So I, I shot on Friday all day and Thursday afternoon, so I was only really doing research three and a half days. And then one and a half days I was spending with um, clin clinicians, uh, which was, was wonderful. She was a PhD, she wasn't even an MD, PhD. She was a PhD alone. Um, and it ended up you know, being a really wonderful 
experience, experience for me. I know that like I don't want to do pipetting anymore. I mean, I did that for those three months, <laughs> and I did great genetics research, which I don't anticipate ever doing again. And it was fantastic. It was a great learning experience. But you know, it is it is so important. And there are a lot of people here. This is a university, and it, what makes the university is that there are people here doing research. Doing re it, your research does not need to be in science. If you are into like ethics research, do ethics research. It does not need to be in science. In fact, in fact, you, it will be unique if you are a person who spends time doing research in something else that's not basic science. It will it will be something interesting to talk about because it's not the same thing that the last hundred people have interviewed and talked about. So. I'm not saying in science. I, I, I recommend everyone do science research because it's, it, it's, it helps you learn how to read science. And when you get to when you get into medical school, that just hits you. You need to start reading journals. You need to start doing this. You you need to understand how research is conducted. So you will have to learn that. So you either going to learn it on your own, or you're going to learn it through one of the experiences. What I'm saying though is that if you're really not wanting to do that right now, you can definitely do some other kind of research. Go ahead. Um, what year? So I did mine the very the same year that I applied. I took the MCAT after I took the MCAT very But the summer that I applied is when I did my first research. And I had planned it that way. Yeah. Would you recommend starting as early as possible? Yeah, absolutely. The more bet more the better. I would say if you can if you can start every summer, I would do something. I would. I would. And it's and especially when you're not getting paid for it, you're the boss. You know, it's your your time, your volunteering time. So you would only contribute to it what you can offer, and that's it. So you know it shouldn't be something that gets in the way of life. Yes. What's your name? What's your name, sir? Alex. Alex. Thank you. So if you. What's your name? Oh, I'm Allie. Allie. Okay. If you're crunched for time and you have the choice between doing classes over the summer mm -hmm. or potentially like applying to other undergraduate programs at other schools, like I know VCU has programs over the summer you can do with them. Mm -hmm. Would you do a summer program or would you continue doing your curriculum? I think it's a very personal decision. So um, if you're crunched for time, you have to figure out when you're going to get that research in. Okay, so like I said, I mean, to think that you're, you're going to be okay in this process without doing research is rough. It's going to be rough. It's like saying, you know, yeah, you can. You can get into medical school with a 3 two. You can. You can get a medical school with three out. You can. But like that doesn't mean it's gonna be easy for you. I think if you want it to be more easy, I would say do some research. I really think it's that important. I I think it's something that is not very well articulated to you guys. But it is that important. Okay? So it's on that level. Yes. Um, I had a question about, you know, What's your name? Morgan. Morgan. Um, I'm graduating. In May, and I've already realized that I haven't taken here because I'll be taking it at this time. But as far as like research goes for people who graduated, I have a session on the gap year today, so that's the last part. So we'll talk about that. Thanks, Morgan. One more here, then I'll go just in, then we gotta go to the next part. Um, What's your name? Ken. Ken. So the MSAR thing, what are the yeah. numbers called? Are they still friends or something? I don't know, but what I can do. So I have a, we go to school with them about you know. I do, it's um, American Student and Dental Association. Um, if you become a member, they'll actually send you the guide in the mail. Yeah. See, you could have met her just like boom. Now you guys, what's your name? Megan. Megan. What's your name? Kim. Megan meet Kim. Kim meet Kim. Megan. You guys know, should link up and talk about these things. It's like, look, she was a resource group just like that. I mean, seriously, these things are important. 